Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Just want to confirm you guys can hear me okay. And When you're driven to get the job done right, the days are long and the miles are many. You can't accept good enough and you don't believe in limits. To make something truly better than before, to make it last, you never settle and demand a higher level of precision. Day in and day out, we're on that path, advancing filtration science developing superior filtration technologies to keep you going, to ensure your performance now and in the future, to protect, to go further, to keep you going, run cleaner, longer, with the certainty of filtration science.
Can you guys hear me okay? Just drop it in the chat if you guys can hear me okay. I saw a couple couple comments come through. Okay, perfect. All right, sounds like you guys are are good to go. So I'll pick back up here. Just a little bit about us. Maybe maybe you're not familiar with Fleet Guard, new to the industry. I know we have uh, folks join kind of the trucking industry and uh, diesel powered industry, uh, various market segments, you know, all the time. And maybe you're not as familiar with the Fleet Guard brand. Uh, we are a filtration and coolant and chemical company that was actually started by Cummins Inc. So uh, the world's largest independent diesel engine company back in the 1950s. Uh, we are separated from Cummins now. Recently uh, went through a spinoff and IPO, and we are now known as Atmos Filtration Technologies. Uh, but our Fleet Guard brand isn't going anywhere. It's still uh, kind of the core part of our company and what we do today. Uh, if you really want to think about kind of what makes us different in the marketplace, and this is a big part of what we're going to talk about today, really those last two bullet points on this slide. Uh, we, we certainly are problem solvers and troubleshooters for our customers, for our dealers, delivery partners, for the fleets that use our products. Uh, we really get into the science piece of it and really help them understand maybe why they're having issues that they are having. It's definitely going to be part of our conversation today. And of course, at the at the heart of all of this is media manufacturing. Uh, we're going to talk more about that in detail, but we are media manufacturers. We manufacture our own filter media in-house, and that gives us a lot of uh, confidence in the performance and the capability and quality of the products that we provide to the marketplace. And that's really what we're going to spend a good chunk of time talking about today. So we kind of start at the outset of this conversation, you know, big picture stuff here. You know, why is engine filtration even necessary? Well, engines do require the use of filtration to provide protection uh, regarding the, whether it's the air that that engine's using uh, for the con uh, combustion process or the fluids that are being used by that engine, whether again, that's you know, lubricating oil or the diesel fuel or whatever fuel source is being used, or maybe it's a hydraulic system that's using hydraulic fluid. Uh, there are contaminants that find their way into those uh, sources. And if you're not protecting the engine from those contaminants, you're going to experience premature wear and potentially or eventually even failure of those uh, critical engine components. And so obviously the healthier we can keep an engine, or one of these hydraulic systems or one of these applications using filtration, obviously the fewer unplanned downtime events we're gonna experience, it's gonna help us reduce those maintenance costs. And at the end of the day, it's gonna pad our wallet and keep more money in the bank account. That's what it's all about. And so as we think about that, where do these engine filtration, uh, where do these contaminants come from that engine filtration is designed to protect against? Well, some of these contaminants come from the system itself. So whether it's an engine or again, some sort of system that uses uh, moving parts, oftentimes you have contaminants that are generated by this, the system. So as things kind of uh, wear from components or, or uh, pieces of, a, of metal touching each other, or plastics, right? Regardless of what the material is, oftentimes those components uh, can generate contamination over time. Uh, sometimes you also have built-in contamination. So, you know, it's not uh, uncommon or unheard of for maybe a brand new engine that's just being used for the first time to experience a little bit of built-in wear uh, or maybe uh, contaminants that are built in from the manufacturing processes that are, you know, things that are kind of left over or byproduct from that process. And so those are things that we have to watch out for. And then really the, the biggest thing, though, that we're going to talk more about today are these contaminants that are ingested by the system. So a great example is we're gonna go through today's session is talking about fuel filtration uh, for those that have been around a long time to, uh, or even a short amount of time for that matter. Ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. Uh, you've got all sorts of contaminants that find their way into that fuel supply uh, from that life cycle of the everything flowing from the refinery, uh, you know, actually the refinery facility all the way to the point at which a consumer is going to dispense that fuel into the fuel tank of a vehicle or piece of equipment. There's a lot of contaminants that find their way in over the course of time. And so these are kind of some sources of contamination that we have to be aware of and uh, be willing to protect against. So we talked about it a second ago, but you know, with 
regards to these different systems for an engine, if it's on the air side of things, or maybe fuel or the oil or lube side of things, or even on the coolant side of things, um, that presents some different challenges for us. Each of these systems are, are certainly different. They operate at different, uh, with re different requirements, different um, tolerances and different types of contamination. And that plays a big part in the development of filter media. You know, many different types of contaminants out there today. And they, they all have an influence on the design and engineering of engine filtration solutions. And so as you look at some of the examples here on the screen, you know, if, if we're talking about an air filtration or an air intake system, you're going to experience, you know, dust, dirt, sand, airborne contaminants. Uh, so not in a wet system, but airborne contaminants. We've got to protect against those. On the fuel side of things, everything from dust, dirt, sand, also finding its way into those liquids, uh, but also water contamination, uh, which then lends to, uh, you know, microorganisms or microbes. Uh, you also have additives that sometimes can cause problems on the fuel filtration side of things. Getting over into the lube, you know, we've got wear metals, like we said before, some of these kind of generated contaminants from the system where maybe two components, maybe power cylinder components are, are touching or scuffing and scraping. And now we've got, you know, wear metals in the system that can cause damage. Uh, dust can also find its way in those systems or even the oil itself, right? The lubrication itself, as it starts to oxidize and break down, can generate some contaminant and cause uh, plugging issues for a lube filter. So basically what we're saying here is, you know, different systems are gonna require different types of approaches from a filtration perspective. And at the end of the day, you know, all of these different systems, I've just got some example products on the screen. So it doesn't matter if it's a hydraulic product or maybe a filter that goes on the, the dosing system of the after treatment part of a, a modern diesel engine, crankcase ventilation, right? The breather, lube filter, fuel filter, coolant filtration. You know, the packaging and application can be, you know, pretty, uh, have kind of a wide variety of uses. But at the end of the day, it's, it's all about the media. The media is what's doing the job. That's what's actually providing the filtration performance and giving that protection to the system. And so media is incredibly, uh, you know, the most important thing. I, I don't know how you, else you can highlight it. It is the thing that differentiates one product in the marketplace versus somebody else. You know, we, we've kind of always said this on our tours and as we do training, you know, it's not very difficult to source the materials to make a you know, make the shell, make the nut plate, make the gasket, you know, certainly you want to have high quality par uh, parts used in those processes, but it's all about the media. The media is what's really doing the filtration work and your filter is going to be as good as the media that's on the inside of that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So as you think about what goes into designing a high quality filter, for you know, specifically talking about engine filtration, right? What are some of the things that go into designing that high quality filtration product? There's really three characteristics or performance categories that that we pay attention to, you know, at a, at a big picture level for designing a filtration product. Up there in the top left, um, you know, arguably one of the most important things, efficiency. And this is a term that's talking about really the rate at which particles are removed. So if we're talking about removing, you know, some of these very fine uh, contaminants or, or particles of contamination in diesel fuel, you know, we've got to not only capture those things, but we've got to capture them at a very high, uh, high level, right? Uh, you know, even letting a little bit of that stuff go through, uh, through the filter and into the clean side, that can cause problems. So efficiency is something that's obviously very important to us. Capacity, though, capacity is also really important. And this is really talking about the amount of contamination that a filter can hold. So, you know, we could, you know, we and other filter manufacturers could create, you know, basically 100% efficient filters and to capture everything that we want to capture. But the problem is that filter is not going to last very long. You know, so capacity is important. You know, how much contamination of the things we're trying to catch can the filter hold? And so as you can understand, there's a little bit of a balancing act between those two things. You know, if you go for 100% efficiency at a very fine, 
you know, very small particle size, you're not going to generally have a lot of capacity. Uh, really, the only way to get around that is to keep making the filter bigger and bigger and uh, add capacity in that respect. But again, if you're talking about uh, a filter application that's going on an engine that's under a hood, you know, on a chassis, you can't make that filter incredibly big, right? You, you've got space constraints, constraints to work through. So you've got to juggle efficiency and capacity. And then something else that does play into the equation is flow restriction. So whether we're talking about air or we're talking about some sort of liquid passing through a filter, we are concerned with restriction. And again, we're talking about the amount of resistance of that air or liquid to pass through the filter. You know, you generally want low flow restriction. You want that oil or that fuel or even the air to have an easy time to pass through that filter. If you've got a high level of restriction, you're essentially causing that engine to have to work harder to get the same amount of air or liquid to pass through that filter. And so you've got a kind of a, a balance between these three performance categories. And it's all about finding the right combination to get the type of product that's really tailored for the needs of the application. And just at the outset of this whole conversation, you know, it is important to note, you know, we as, as Fleet Guard, as a part of Atmos, as we design OEM product or even aftermarket product, you know, our filters are designed for the constraints and the technical parameters of the application that it's going into. Uh, now, in some instances where uh, maybe we're an aftermarket part going into uh, an application that we're not the OE, we always try to make our product, you know, we're going to strive to make our product equivalent to that OE product. And in some instances, our product may actually perform better than that OE product, you know, so giving either a higher level of efficiency or, uh, you know, lower flow restriction, those types of things. But these are the parameters we're generally trying to work through. Uh, if you've ever wondered why a filter has pleats or kind of has that accordion style fold to it, if you've ever cut open a filter and looked, or maybe a filter cartridge kind of element style filter that you can just see on the outside, uh, that is part of giving that filter greater capacity. We're going to basically build in the uh, ability for us to have greater media content. So we've got more filter media because of the pleating giving us greater capacity. So if you've ever wondered that, that's why we do that. So you can't talk about media without talking about micron ratings. And for some of you guys that are on the call here, you, you've heard about micron ratings, I'm sure, through the course of your career. Maybe don't really have all that great of an understanding of it, or, or maybe your customers don't if you go and call on customers that are, are purchasing filters from you. Um, so a little bit of discussion here around microns. You know, what is a micron and why does it even matter? You know, why does this stuff, why is this even part of this conversation? Well, a micron, it's really important. A micron is just an uh, easy thing to remember here. It's, it's a unit of measurement. So a micron is kind of like an inch or a centimeter or a millimeter. It's just much, much smaller than those things. Uh, a micron, one micron is equal to one millionth of a meter. So it's very, very, very small. You know, one micron is very small. Uh, there in that second bullet, there's 25,400 microns in one inch. So we're talking, you know, obviously stuff smaller than, you know, one micron's clearly smaller than what you can see with the naked eye. So I've got some examples of things from everyday life that kind of put into maybe some perspective the size that we're talking about here. So a couple things to point out as you kind of look at those things listed there through the middle of the screen. You know, the human eye, the limit of visibility for a human eye, you know, with no uh, extra tools or anything to see smaller, it's generally, you know, down to about 40 microns is, is about where we start kind of losing visibility with our own eyes. When you start going smaller than that, you know, about 25 to 20 microns, you know, this is typically when you're talking about a lube system, uh, you know, on an engine with uh, components like bearings and, you know, uh, crankshaft, camshaft, those kinds of things. That, that's typically about how small you get with some of the tolerances between some of those components and the lube system on an engine. Then working your way even smaller than that, you know, a hydraulic system. So with hydraulic pistons, uh, they typically have tolerances down into kind of the uh, kind of the single digit range there. You know, we're showing about six microns 
Uh, so if you, as you think about some of those hydraulic systems with, um, you know, very sensitive components, uh, you, you can get down to very, uh, very fine, very small particle sizes. And then a little bit of what we're going to mention today, you know, as you think about high pressure common rail fuel systems, so fuel injection systems, you know, we are concerned with particles all the way down to about four microns in those systems. And just for some comparison there, again, look at some of the things that are above that uh, and kind of that range or scale of, of size particles that we see there. So we're going to talk more about those uh, carboxylate globules there. So, you know, two to one microns, but, uh, you know, common bacteria, water droplets, uh, those are things that are all kind of in this range, you know, four microns and above that we're interested in capturing out of one of these fuel systems. So a, a question that we get asked sometimes, you know, do you guys, you guys make your own media? You know, who makes their own media? And the reality of it, you know, when you think about the filtration industry, you know, for filter companies that are making products in the space that we operate in today, so filters that are going on to engines and hydraulic systems, you know, the reality is that, you know, some filter companies make their own media, but most don't. Uh, there are a handful of companies around the world that produce filtration media. And, you know, these media grades that are being generated uh, can be used in engine filtration. But if you go and research any of these companies, these are just some example ones on the screen. You know, they are, there are lots of other industries, you know, apart from trucking and mining, uh, oil and gas, you know, the things that many of us touch on a day-to-day -day basis. Media is used in lots of other applications. You know, so think food and, be food and beverage, medical industries, right? Lots of other things. And so you've got some companies around the world that produce media. And many of the fleet guard competitors out there in our space today are purchasing from these companies. Um, and which we, of course, have access to go and purchase similar materials, right? So if you want to think about that, you know, most, most of your engine filter companies don't make their own media they're kind of shopping out of a basket of materials that are available to essentially lots of different industries. So hopefully that's interesting or helpful to everybody here. So we're going to talk about common types of filter media today. We're going to kind of work from the left side of our screen to the right side of our screen, but on the left side of the screen, we've got cellulose. That's kind of where we'll start. This is your traditional or legacy filter media. It's usually a low cost media solution uh, and Again, as you think about technologies, this is kind of your old school stuff that's out there in the marketplace today. So for many of you guys that uh, maybe do your own filter changes on you know, your, your personal vehicle at your house, you know, if you walk into an auto parts store or one of these things online, you know, I would imagine more than 99% of the time, the filters that are being used in kind of automotive or light duty applications, it's gonna be a cellulose filter. It, it's a paper media. Uh, that's, you know, kind of a, a low technology, uh, kind of low cost product. Uh, generally speaking, they're less efficient than uh, some of the other types that we're going to look at kind of up the stream to the right. Uh, but you can use these in combination with these other types. And, and you know, that can help you from a perform performance perspective. Number two on the screen there, microglass. This is generally considered a, another legacy filter media type. That's been used in the industry for a long time and still is used in the industry today, just like cellulose is. Uh, microglass, though, it you can get high performance out of it. So greater holding capacity of those contaminants we talked about. Uh, you can also get greater efficiency of, than what you would see with a cellulose media. Um, you've got kind of small chopped fibers. So in a similar process to what you would maybe see with the cellulose, you're basically taking chopped fibers, uh, think about kind of like fiberglass fibers, and it's essentially manufactured in a, in a wet laid paper making process. So you basically got a, a vat of these chopped fibers, you spread it all out on, into a big sheet, and as it dries, it kind of turns into a, a sheet of this material and kind of almost kind of like a paper. Uh, we're going to talk more about glass later on. Glass, like I said, it is still commonly used in the marketplace today, but it really is a legacy technology. Then as you start working even further, right? So number three, we're going to look at melt blown media. That's something we're going to talk about in a second. This is when you're taking a polymer material. So essentially like a plastic material, taking pellets of this stuff, 
you're melting it down into a liquid that's basically the consistency of water. And you're going to extrude these fibers out using, using a high velocity kind of high speed air system to blow these fibers out onto a drum that collects. And we'll see what that looks like in just a second. The benefit of this is you can get very fine fibers, similar, you know, similar in, in size to what you see with like a microglass. But the real advantage is they're continuous fibers. So no more chopped fibers that are being held together by glue and resin, that type of thing. You have continuous fibers. So there's no broken pieces. Uh, it gives you a much stronger structure. And uh, you can certainly, you know, even in a non-woven product, it, you can get really great performance out of this. I and mean, you can get down to very, very fine fiber diameters. So all the way down to, you know, kind of low single digit microns, which is really important. You know, that's about a fifth the size of those cellulose fibers you might see over on the right. So much, much finer fibers. And then the newest and kind of latest technology that, that's been in the marketplace now for, for a handful of years is when you get into these nanofibers. So as the name would indicate, these are submicron, you know, very, very fine fibers, even finer than what we just saw with the melt blown technologies, but they're still continuous fibers. So no chopped pieces, no glues, resins holding these things together. So, you know, very strong. And it really does act like a bit of a net, which is, a you know, maybe a teaser for when we talk about nano net in a second. But these give really the best performance possible in capturing very fine particles. The other advantage it gets you is because you've got very fine fibers, uh, it, it allows for lower flow restriction. So we talked about that being a good thing earlier, you know, with big fibers, you know, the fluid is not flowing through those fibers. So it's got to work around the fibers. So with really fine fibers, it allows the fluid to flow through it very easily. And so that gives us a great balance of particle removal. So that efficiency we talked about also gives us the ability to uh, really help with life of kind of managing these contaminants. We'll see that in a second. And then that flow restriction. Uh, the other benefit you know, with a melt blown or nanofiber is you're using a polymer material. So when you think about, again, like plastics, you're not going to see degradation of these fibers or these media grades over time. That is something you tend to see with cellulose and microglass. Again, they're not uh, inherently, uh, again, the, the way they're manufactured, you've got kind of chopped pieces, chopped fibers with glues, those types of things. Over time, that stuff tends to kind of wear out and degrade. Things kind of shed. They like to kind of pass downstream. You just don't see that with the melt blown and nanofiber because of the nature of the way it's manufactured and the materials that are used. But I don't want it to be lost that, you know, this conversation is not just saying, hey, nanofiber is awesome. Only use nanofiber. That's not really what we're saying here. In red across the top of the screen, right? What filter manufacturers do is we try to find the right combination of these materials and these media types. And, you know, think about going into Subway and uh, making a Subway sandwich and you've got your bread, you choose your bread, you choose the different cheese or meat or whatever kind of toppings you want to put on it. And that gets you that end product, you know, that you pay for at the checkout. Uh, and that's basically what we're doing here. We're going to take a look and trying to find, all right, what's the performance characteristics we're looking for in this filter we're going to make. And then we're going to go shopping and see, you know, what kind of materials we can use to put in this product. Give us the, the best possible outcome. Now, something that's really interesting that, that I've learned over time being a part of our organization is that, you know, kind of what we're saying here, the size of contaminants we're trying to capture, that's going to dictate what type of media we use. Now, our experience in doing this stuff for, for decades now as a business is that whatever size particle you're trying to capture, so if we're, if we're trying to capture something that's in that four micron range or six micron range like we looked at on the fuel systems, the good rule of thumb we've learned is that you need the diameter of those fibers in that media you're using. They need to be about a tenth of the size of the particle that you're trying to capture. And so that becomes really important as you think about that rule of thumb on a fuel system. If we're going to go after four micron particles and that fiber diameter needs to be a tenth of the size of the particle we're looking to capture, cellulose, microglass in, in some instances, you know, even the melt blown, that may not get the job done. You know, you're going to need to look at nanofiber to really get that type of performance. 
So just quickly looking at these, you know, just some pictures for you guys to see some of these things maybe up a little bit more close. Uh, this is our cellulose or paper media. You can even tell just looking at the photos, you know, it looks a little bit more organic, um, which makes sense because it's it's paper. Um, so, you know, as you look there, uh, the different magnifications, you know, we've got 50 uh, mag over on the left, working towards 500 in the middle, and then a thousand times magnification on the right. You kind of start to understand, you know, you've got fairly large pore sizes and you've got fairly large fiber diameters. So, you know, when you're thinking about going after those really fine particles, now it starts to make sense why you can't really trust or, or rely on cellulose to go after really fine particles. Just... It's not going to cut it. Um, that's also why you see cellulose most commonly used on air filters, why you see them commonly used on uh, lube oil or oil filters. You know, so you think about that passenger car application we talked about, you know, you're generally going after larger particle sizes, you know, 15 to 30 microns is kind of more in that range of what we're, what we're interested in on the lube side of things. I did want to point out quickly, if you've been using fleet guard parts, maybe going back, you know, I know we've got folks that have been in our industries, uh, you know, a couple decades or longer. Uh, if you've ever seen the inside of one of our fleet guard lube filters kind of from, from back in the day, you may have noticed these little kind of snowflake accordion looking uh, pieces of media inside some of those filters. And this is what we call stack disc. Uh, stack disc was really designed for handling sludge in, or, or kind of oxidized oil in a lube filter scenario. Um, and the way it worked basically was, you know, that kind of top portion of the filter that was using that stack disc, it was kind of acting like a bypass filter. And so the majority of the oil was flowing through kind of that media element you see on the bottom there. Uh, and then that stack disc was seeing a portion of the oil and kind of super cleaning that oil uh, with a really high efficiency. You know, it was kind of designed for low flow but it was designed for really high efficiency. So if you've ever used a fleet guard product like the LF3000 or LF9009, you know, these would be kind of typical designs of what you would see still using that stack disc media. Lubricant technology has gotten a lot better. So we don't really see engine sludge occurring as much in heavy duty diesel applications. And so the newer products that we've moved to uh, basically don't use stack disc anymore. We've essentially replaced that with nanofiber and it kind of gives us the best of both worlds. The filter kind of acts like more like a full flow, but that nanofiber gives you kind of that high efficiency, almost like a bypass section, which I think I've got a slide in here that'll show that in just a, in just a moment. So we moved to microglass. And as you look at microglass, you know, you can kind of tell just from looking at the pictures, right? You, you can see broken pieces. You can see chopped pieces where, you know, you can look at a fiber and kind of track it to the end. And you see the end of that fiber. Um, it is, again, a man-made material. Uh, you can get a broad range of fiber diameters. Uh, oftentimes, people that use glass are using it in conjunction with cellulose because glass does tend to be kind of... Uh, Kind of brittle, uh, maybe temperamental is probably not the right word, but you know these fibers can shed, and so that's something you need to pay attention to. It does require a binder to keep those fibers together. So if you look at that picture on the left, you can kind of see you know some of those glues and resins kind of holding some of the, that stuff together. Uh, it is worth noting, you know, some OEMs across the world have kind of moved away from uh, glass if if they can help it, uh, be, because it is known that you know, this glass does tend to shed uh, and that can cause, you know, some, you know, premature wear and things on, you know, if it's a sensitive fuel system or something like that downstream, you know, that's something that would you'd be wanting to pay attention to. So we moved to melt blown. And again, this is where you're taking a polymer material, melting it down, blowing it out on a drum, and you've got these continuous fibers. You know, if you look at any of these pictures on the screen, you can really, you know, find a fiber and sort of track it to the end. You don't really see ends of fibers because it's all continuous. Um, so think kind of more like a spider web. Um, you do have really good performance with these. You know, it's very typical to have high efficiency you know, up in that high 98 percentile, um, you know, at around 10 microns or, or maybe a little less than that. Um, so, you know, very good performance out of this. And again, it's plastic. So if you think about maybe a fuel water separation situation, or if you think about, you know, fuel filtration, as we know, with water in bio, uh, diesel fuel, or even in biofuel, this stuff, it's generally pretty water resistant. So it does a good job of, of helping strip water 
out of diesel fuel. So just some pictures here, right? When we talk about those polymer pellets, you know, you're basically taking that material, melting it down, blowing it out of a, a die at high velocity, and it collects on a drum, and it gives you, you know, essentially you can kind of go in and really tailor or customize the, the exact fiber size you want, and, you know, it gives you that ability to really customize the performance of the product. Which is a good segue into what we do. You know, I mentioned earlier, not all filter companies make their own media. Actually, it's pretty uncommon for filter companies to do that. Most of them are going and shopping from third parties that make this stuff, you know, kind of in bulk for lots of other industries outside of just even what we do. Uh, but we have been in the filter manufacturing business since kind of the late 1980s, early 1990s. And we've got a lot of experience with this. So uh, it gives us a lot of customized uh, solutions for our customers. We've got uh, a lot of experts that have been around doing this for decades. And you know, it really allows us to tailor the performance of the product for the customer's needs. And, and we're really on the cutting edge of this stuff. So you know, melt blowing as a technology, it's it's been around a little while, you know, going back, uh, I think, to around the 1950s. You know, the, the Navy, I believe, was using it for um, some kind of specific application. It wasn't really being used for filters, but you know, it was a technology that we picked up through the years and figured out how to kind of bring it in-house and really perfect it. And we've been doing that now for, you know, a little over 30 years. So just some pictures here, of things you can see. So if you've been, you know, again, if you've been using Fleet Guard over the years, if maybe you've heard of Stratopore, Stratopore is just our brand name for our melt blown media. So we do make this in-house. If you ever get a chance to come to Nashville, maybe we've got some folks on the call that have been to our facility over in Cookville, Tennessee, about an hour east of Nashville. It's where our media center is and we make this stuff on site. So you can see some of the characteristics here. Um, and we do typically use our melt blown media in a wide variety of fuel filtration products, fuel water separator products, and then even in some of our lube filtration products as well. And then next, I want to move over into nanofiber. So as you think about nanofiber kind of being the, the latest, greatest stuff that's in the marketplace today, you know, again, we're talking about sub micron fiber sizes. So fibers that have a diameter smaller than one micron gives you very uniform pores. So pore sizes, you know, being this, essentially the space between the fibers and then the structure of those fibers overall really does, you know, give you that extreme level of performance to be able to go after very, very fine particles. You know, we're looking at the size of those fibers on the right, uh, right side of the screen at a thousand times magnification. Um, this is technology that we really pioneered in, uh, you know, for our industry, and have kind of been the torchbearers for, for high pressure common rail fuel systems. So when you think about NanoNet, if you've ever been around Fleet Guard, you've probably seen some of our part numbers that have this NanoNet logo on them, or uh, you've maybe noticed the NN suffix on our part numbers. This is media that was designed for high pressure common rail. That's what it's all about. And so it allows us to kind of stack and layer some of these technologies into a kind of finished good product. So NanoNet is kind of our brand name for kind of these patented layers that we put together and it gives you kind of this finished good kind of Subway sandwich if you want to think of that. So we're going to use some of our melt blown technology, kind of stack some layers there, and then also back it with that nanofiber to get really that finest level of particle removal and retention. The real benefit, you know, uh, uh, the, not just the ability to go after very fine particles, but the other advantage that this gives you is that particle retainment, as you see there in kind of the left side of that red box, better particle retainment during transient conditions. Now you might be going, what is a transient condition? Well, when you think about an engine that's on a vehicle or a piece of equipment, something that's going out and doing work, you have transient conditions, you know, these dynamic conditions like vibration. You know, is that engine, is that engine sitting still or is it vibrating? It's vibrating, it's shaking. Uh, as you're accelerating, uh, you know, maybe getting on the throttle, if that's a truck that you're accelerating down the on-ramp, getting on the getting on the freeway, getting on the interstate, you've got flow surge. You have all of these things that, you know, it's not a static situation where that filter is just seeing the exact same amount of flow at the exact same pressure, you know, in the exact same scenario. You have these transient conditions. And the ability to stack and layer these media types 
especially capping it off with that nanofiber, it really, it acts like a net. It is grabbing all of these things and it holds onto these particles much better than what we see from competitive uh, media types out there. You know, particularly when you talk, start talking about glass and cellulose and some of the more legacy things that are out there. This combination, this has been the real benefit we've seen with customers over the years. And, you know, another point of emphasis, I, I think we normally try to talk about this when we have customers in on tours through the facility. You know, it's not just about capturing the contaminant. It, it's, it is about managing the contamination, you know, because we want to go back to those three parameters we talked about at the beginning of the call. It's not just about efficiency. It's also about capacity. You know, it's no good to you as a consumer if, or if you're managing a fleet or have equipment. It's no good to you if you're capturing the stuff we need to capture, but the filter has incredibly short life. You know, you need that filter to last, you know, during this, the, those service intervals. And so we want to manage this contaminant. And that's what we're able to do with these multi-layered kind of gradients. It, it's about gradient filtration. Uh, and I love that little infographic that kind of plays there in the middle of the screen, kind of showing all these layers and how it loads these particles over time, you know, through that service life of that filter. So, you know, maybe layer one is going after 15 micron size particles. Layer two is going after 10. Layer three is maybe going after seven. And then layer four, maybe it's going after four micron particles. And so we're going to kind of load each of those layers with the different size contaminants. And that's going to give us that longer life, longer capacity. So our ability you know, in-house capability to manufacture media being vertically integrated with melt blowing. Uh, we've uh, obviously gotten over to the nanofiber things over the years uh, and even newer technologies we're working on. We can go in and customize fiber sizes. We can use different types of materials, different polymers. We can customize those pore sizes. Uh, we can change up the number of layers that we want in our product. Uh, and the overall thickness of that media, that finished good media product that's going to go into the filter itself. We have the ability to really tailor everything that's going on in that filter. And so I mentioned this earlier, but nanofiber and lube applications. So maybe you guys have heard of the, the LF14000NN or LF14001NN. This is kind of the, the OEM lube filter that goes on Cummins heavy duty uh, truck engines, right? So 12 liter, 15 liter engines, that kind of thing. This is where we basically took our nanofiber and replaced the cellulose portion of that filter with nanonet, with our nanofiber. So it still kind of gives you that bypass effect without really being a true bypass. It you know, basically gives you that low flow restriction you know, where the stack disk gave you quite a bit more restriction. And so we're kind of getting the best of both worlds. So you know, again, if you see, even on the lube side of things, if you see a fleet guard lube filter it has the NN suffix, it's telling you that's a nanonet part. So we get kind of the end here of, you know, comparing some of these different technologies. And, and really it is just, you know, this is just kind of to give you that stark difference of technologies in the marketplace. When you look at a cellulose media, kind of a legacy media, you're going to see fibers that have diameters, you know, 15 to 30 microns, pretty, pretty typical. When you get into a nanofiber situation, you know, those fibers, the diameters of those fibers are, you know, down to submicron levels. You know, they're smaller, significantly smaller than a micron. We're going to talk about fuel systems in just one second. But, you know, as we think about getting down to those low single digit microns, it's pretty obvious, pretty easy to understand why you have to be using newer media technologies for newer applications. You know, your trucks and, and equipment of old, you know, maybe from the 90s and older, they can handle a lot of a lot more contaminant in the fuel system. But if you're talking about a 2024 truck or a piece of equipment with a modern fuel system, you can't allow that stuff to go through the fuel system. You're going to see premature wear and eventual failure of some of those components, and we've got to protect against that. This is all, you know, again, we, we looked at some microns earlier, but just perspective. Um, sometimes looking at these media pictures don't really mean a lot to, to the average person, but to put all that in perspective, a human red blood cell, it's about eight microns on average. I think it's absolutely astounding that we're removing contaminants from the fuel system on modern diesel engines. It's half the size of a human red blood cell. It's just absolutely incredible.
So we talk about engine evolution, right? These newer engines that are in the marketplace today and obviously where those uh, engines are going to continue trending moving into the future. You know, we're coming up on 2027 for the kind of the trucking industry. That's going to be sort of the next iteration of uh, a lot of these diesel, uh, heavy duty diesel engines. And it's not, you know, sometimes we look at uh, new technology is not as good. It, you know, it has flaws, it has problems. And, you know, there, there are certainly more uh, complexities built into these new engines than what we've seen over the years. It's not all bad, though, right? I mean, we, we are seeing longer drain intervals than ever before. Generally speaking, reliability is improving, uh, improved fuel economy. And again, at the end of the day, we're, we're chasing emissions, you know, whether we like it or not, that's that is a good thing, and uh, we we want to uh, help in that respect. But in order to see any of those benefits, there are requirements that these engines have to have. We have to have cleaner diesel fuel, which again is a big part of this media conversation. Uh, the oil grades, oil chemistry, as we mentioned, that's got a lot better, and that's helped with these drain intervals and and changed some of the influences on lube filtration. Uh, but overall, better filtration is required for these new engines. So just an example here, you know, if you guys have been on any of the training I've ever done with fuel systems, this is just a little bit of an example of what we're talking about. Everything we've learned as a filtration company over the years, and certainly being a part of Cummins, uh, the diesel engine manufacturer for a long time, you know, we learned that about 7 to 15 micron size particles, kind of in that range. These are the size particles of things in diesel fuel that start causing wear on sensitive high pressure common rail injector components. Once that damage starts to occur, you've got particles that are now down to about 4 micron that will actually kind of accelerate and speed up the wear on those components. So that's kind of where we get down to about that 4 micron number. So putting that in perspective, you know, this is actually a image we took at our lab in Cookville, Tennessee at our tech center. And, and I like it because this was basically, you know, a sample of diesel fuel that we, you know, ran across a, a very uh, tight media patch and we took, let it dry and we took pictures of it with our scanning electron microscope. And you can see some of these discrete particle sizes that are kind of right there in that seven, 10, 15 micron range. You know, these are the types of things that are flowing through a fuel system and causing wear on sensitive injector components. So really incredible. You know, we're talking high pressure, very tight, uh, you know, component tolerances or clearances between those things. And, you know, as a result, any of this stuff that we're not capturing with a fuel filter, it's going to go right through that fuel system and it's going to start scoring and causing wear. So it really is uh, quite remarkable. Now, the good news is, you know, we've talked about nanonet, we've talked about nanofiber media technology and that evolution. You know, we've largely kind of solved this problem, you know, if you're using these products. Uh, if you're not, you're, you're really not protecting yourself against those things. But, but we do have solutions that help with that. Um, this is a great example of a product on the screen that is designed to go right after particles in that range that we know to be detrimental or, or dangerous to a, a pressure, uh, high pressure common rail fuel system, you know, right over 99% at four micron particles. Um, so that's kind of a, an important thing as you think about micron ratings. It's not just, hey, I need a seven micron filter, or I need a 10 micron filter, you need to know how efficient that filter is going to be at that particle size. Just saying, hey, this filter says it's 10 micron. Okay, well, is it is it 99% efficient at 10 micron or is it 75% efficient at 10 micron? Because those are wildly different performance measures and metrics. So it's always important. Tag an efficiency number to that micron size. I talked about this a little bit earlier on, so I'm not going to go into this too much. But as you think about, you know, kind of why does NanoNet shine compared to maybe some competitive product in the market? You know, glass media, you know, the, the downside to glass media, you, you can get good performance out of it. But as a result of that manufacturing process, you can see fibers kind of work their way loose and they tend to release particles under those transient conditions or dynamic conditions we talked about earlier. So, you know, think about a, a flower sifter and you and maybe you've got a bunch of flour in it. OK, well, as long as that thing's not moving, everything stays put. As soon as you start moving that thing, shaking it side to side, it's going to start releasing flour. That's essentially what we see commonly with some of these glass filters, uh, glass media filters. They, they tend to perform pretty good at the start, but over time, 
performance really starts to drop off. And by the end of the life of that product, they're, they're really not working the way they were when they were brand new. Exactly the opposite situation with the nanofiber products. We don't see that. We don't see degradation of the product over time. And it's really because of the materials that are used and the manufacturing processes that are used. That product's going to perform at the highest level all the way through the life of the product. So just a good example. Uh, I'm not not uh, not taking shots here intentionally, but just a good example of what's common in the marketplace. So that same filter we just looked at a second ago, the FF5825NN, this was the OE filter on Cummins, uh, again, heavy duty engines. So you, you're talking 12 liter, 15 liter. Um, th these are very common parts out in the industry today on sale. You know, and as we talked about earlier, anybody can make a steel shell. Anybody can make nut plates. Anybody can make gaskets, you know, center tube, all the other materials. It's the media that's going to really separate one filter from another. And when you look at the guts of these filters and the different layers that go into the media that's being used, what do we see? What we see with that competitive product, we're going to see a couple of layers of glass and we're going to see a layer of cellulose. What do you see with the fleet guard product? You're going to see a couple of layers of melt blown. And we've got a layer of nanofiber, um, which equals that nanonet grade of media. Hence why it's got that NN suffix, why it's got the nanonet on it. Very different in terms of the way these things are constructed. So yeah, similar products from the outside, on the inside, very different materials. Just some peace of mind, you know, from a Cummins perspective and, and from a, you know, as, as you think about you know, our involvement in generating this new technology and kind of what it's done in the marketplace over the years. You know, when we introduced NanoNet out into the market for Cummins to use, their injector claims, the, the warranty claims through uh, the injector side of their business dropped over 40%. It was a huge benefit to, the, to them as an engine company moving to NanoNet and really giving them protection. Again, it goes, it's really targeting exactly the size contaminants we know to be dangerous. It holds on to them better than anything else through the entire life of the filter. And it's going to keep those injectors working like new as long as you're using NanoNet. So at a big picture, if we kind of zoom back out in this conversation, you know, talking about media, talking about kind of where the kind of where the you know the frontier of media development is for engine filtration, it really is fuel systems. It's it's really all about fuel filtration. Um, as we said, kind of the early challenges we saw with these modern fuel systems, you've got hard discrete particles, kind of abrasive particles in about that four to 15 micron range. Um, they come from all sorts of different points of entry during that kind of supply line of, you know, fuel moving from refinery all the way to the point that's being used. And largely we figured that out. You know, we kind of figured out how to combat that with NanoNet. But the newer challenges that we're starting to see, you know, as these engines continue to evolve and as fuels continue to evolve, we're starting to see kind of more contaminant on the side of soft gels and soaps and carboxylates. I mentioned that carboxylate uh, globule. Um, and these are being, actually being generated by chemical reactions. So we've got different fuel types, we've got different fuel systems, and it's actually generating these soft gels that start causing premature plugging issues. And that's required us to really go back and sort of assess, okay, NanoNet worked great for this other stuff, but it, maybe it's not working so great here. It, you know, it's stopping it, but it's giving us very short life. So that's required us to go back to the drawing board a little bit. And we've got newer technologies that we're working on. And uh, it's still a little bit, uh, you know, in the, in the oven being baked. Uh, we don't have product out there quite yet using it. Um, in terms of new, you know, new technologies, we do have some new stuff that's in the pipeline, uh, but we have started spending a lot of time and effort and resource as a business uh, going after these new types and, and starting to come out with some solutions for our customers. And uh, that is our goal. We want to provide the very best possible solutions through this filtration science methodology. And it's working. It's providing benefit to our customers. And, you know, we're not done yet. I just want to be clear there. Uh, nobody does media like us. And, and we are really pushing the next generation of these media technologies for uh, not just fuel filtration, but engine filtration and beyond. 
And that's why, like, if, if you guys have ever used Fleet Guard before, or maybe maybe you're new to the conversation and you didn't know this, we do carry what we consider to be the best warranty in the industry. It is a non-prorated warranty. And that means anybody using Fleet Guard products, if they ever had an engine problem or engine failure, engine damage caused by our product failing or not doing its job, we go to bat for the customer and we provide a non-prorated warranty. That means we are going to provide the full value back to the customer to either repair the engine or in the event that we you know, completely toasted an engine, we're gonna buy the customer or buy you a new engine. That is a huge benefit. And you can understand why we have the confidence in our product because of that media development, knowing we know exactly how our product is going to work and how it's going to perform. So we stand behind the product and, and that's something you guys should you know take home uh, for the future. Just a final word of caution, and I'm going to break here. I know, I know this has been a, a long training here, but uh, just a final word of caution. You know, we have seen over the last couple of years, I don't know if it's coming out of COVID, we've seen a lot of counterfeit products coming from overseas to the North America market. Um, I just want to, reiterate to everybody here in this call, we do not sell through online retailers directly. So Amazon, eBay, you know, online e-commerce sites like that, Fleet Guard and Atmos Technologies, uh, Filtration Technologies, we do not sell directly through those avenues. Uh, that does not mean that all the product that's on those sites being sold is counterfeit, but it's a gamble. You know, we have no way to know until you know, the customer gets the product and they have an issue and we get our hands on the product and we're able to determine, yeah, this is not something we made. Um, so I do want to point that out. I know sometimes, especially for end users, it's tempting to uh, think, oh, I'm going to save a few bucks and go get it here. Or, you know, maybe there's a, a, a situation where I can't get it from the place I normally do. I'm just going to, in this pinch situation, go buy it here. That really is a risk. Uh, we are not going to warrant any sort of engine damage or failure in the event that we can determine, yeah, this is a counterfeit product. It is not genuine. It was not made by Fleet Guard. Um, so this is a little bit of a, just a, a warning for everybody out there, a caution, cautionary tale. We see this uh, happening more frequently over the last 18 to 24 months. Uh, we would highly encourage you, if you are interested in buying Fleet Guard products, always make sure that you're getting the genuine product. And that is done and made possible by going to an authorized Fleet Guard dealer or distributor. We have a dealer locator tool on our website. You can go to fleetguard.com and see the nearest place to you where you can purchase Fleet Guard product. Uh, but we just highly encourage you, you know, to do, do your homework there and just, you know, take this uh, with a bit of salt. You know, we, we just would hate for anybody to think they're getting a genuine Fleet Guard product and get that awesome warranty we just talked about and then have issues and, and realize they were using counterfeit. That's filtration science to keep you going. We've talked a little bit about media today. I hope this has been value added for you guys. Um, if you have any questions you want to drop in that Q&A window, I apologize. It's not, uh, the chat window is not open, I think, for you guys. But the Q&A window, you can drop some stuff, some questions in there. So I'll try to answer a couple of those while we've got a minute. I do want to throw up on the screen. If uh, you want to go out and check that survey out, you should get a link as well. Uh, but I'll take a moment here and try and field some questions. I see Justin's question, are the carboxylates or, ge or gels due to hotter engines nowadays? Uh, that is one of the things we, we have seen, Justin. So uh, specifically with one of the OEMs in the marketplace, um, Volvo specifically, Volvo Mac applications, their fuel system, they, they were having some issues with these carboxylates, these gels and soaps that were plugging up their filters. And we they they approached us say hey we need some help and we went to went to work uh, with the filtration science stuff and what we figured out was that their fuel systems are actually cooking the the biofuel content uh, in the fuel supply that they're using you know at a, their customers have access to just on a global scale right so this was occurring across North America South America Europe you know Volvo is a global OEM right. And yeah, basically it was it was cooking and gener uh, generating these soft gels in the fuel and it was just plugging the filters up. So we had to kind of go back and work with them to develop, you know, kind of a, a new combination of filters that would would catch that stuff and also not give super short life. 
Uh, Chris, are all the filters that were previously Stratopore upgraded to NanoNet? So no, that's uh, that's a good question. And no, uh, we still have a lot of Stratopore products in the marketplace, uh, and, and it's not uncommon for us to to kind of carry a good, better, best situation. So you know, there may be some filters where we have, you know, kind of a, a maybe a cellulose or paper version. We've got a Stratopore version, and then we have a NanoNet version, kind of across a range. Uh, but generally, if you know, if we're the OEM filter for that application, you know, that filter was designed to meet the requirements of the system. So, you know, if that filter, if that engine came OEM with a Stratopore filter, you know, it's perfectly fine to use a Stratopore. If you want to upgrade to a NanoNet, you know, that's going to just give you even better protection, but it may not necessarily be, be needed. Um, I would say it's not a good idea to go backwards compatible though. So if you're, you know, running a brand new truck or, or application that came with a NanoNet filter on it from the factory, you don't want to downgrade and go to a Stratopore or to a, you know, maybe a legacy version that, you know, quote, will fit on the engine. Um, you, you want to make sure you're giving it the protection that it needs. So hopefully that answers your question there, Chris. Um, let's see. And uh, yeah, Justin, uh, just another one there. Do you do oil analysis in-house? We do have the capability to do some of that stuff at our tech center. But uh, if you're looking at those part numbers, we actually do have a program called Monitor. Uh, that we partner with Polaris Laboratories. They're a globally accredited, ISO accredited uh, lab that has locations um, across different countries. And uh, we do have fleet guard part numbers that you can do fuel, oil, and coolant sampling with where they'll send it off. Your, your results will come back to you uh, with a login on a portal where you can see all that stuff. So that would be our recommendation. But you know, if you ever had some kind of specific thing that you wanted us to look at in-house, you know, get in touch with us and, and we can work on that. We're just not really set up for high volume at our, at our tech center. Uh, folks, I know, I know we are past the hour. If anybody needs to drop, totally understand that, but I've still seen a couple questions through. So I'm just going to try to answer those. If folks have time here, uh, Rob, I see your question. Uh, I see you can buy fleet guard on Amazon. Are you saying they're counterfeit? Yeah. So that my point was that we do not directly as fleet guard sell product on amazon there are resellers out there that could be reselling genuine product but we also know there are a lot of folks selling product on amazon and ebay and places like that that are selling counterfeit product that's coming from overseas um so you know if you're looking at the product and there are the pictures and they don't exactly look right something looks a little off the font looks a little weird or maybe that product shows up that you ordered and maybe you still have the old one that you just took off the engine. Definitely compare those and look at them and see how they look. Um, sometimes they look really good on the outside. They look identical and then you cut them open and they're very different on the inside. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a wide range. If you guys ever run into a product that you believe is counterfeit, please reach out to us. We would really like to get our hands on it. We are you know, very much interested in trying to understand how we can get our arms around the problem. This is not just a fleet guard issue. This is a uh, multi-industry problem uh, with counterfeiting, uh, but, but it certainly would help us out. We'd at least like to take a look at it. Uh, and then, yeah, another question here. Good questions, Justin. So do you recommend OEM change intervals even when using an oil sampling program? Yeah, from a kind of a legality standpoint, right? Like if the OEM sets the intervals, you know, we would recommend sticking with the OEM change intervals. Um, if you're using an oil sampling program, you may have the ability to talk with your OEM and extend those drain intervals if everything looks healthy. Uh, but, you know, that's that's kind of a you that, that's kind of an up to you situation, Justin. I mean, if you if you're thinking, yeah, the oil looks good, I'm, all the results coming back look good, you know, that that's that's your call. Uh, if you were to have engine problems though, or engine damage, uh, it's pretty likely the OEM is going to come back and ask you know those kind of details, and you know they may not warrant that in the event that something goes wrong. But you know certainly, you know we we see the benefit of oil technologies have gotten a lot better. The lubricant technologies have gotten a lot better, and fleets and other folks are pushing those drain intervals out longer than ever before. Um, so something to think about. Uh, we do have a real-time monitoring solution, Justin. It's called Fleet Guard FIT, and FIT stands for Filtration Intelligence Technologies. We can actually provide real-time uh, insights into oil health, oil quality. 
Um, so if you're interested in that, go to the Fleet Guard website or you can go to fleetguardfit.com. It'll redirect to you. You can read up on that a little bit more, but that can be something you know interesting to you apart from just regular oil sampling as well. Uh, Chris, I see another question here on the lube side of things. It seems most or all of them use what appear to be nitrile anti-drain back valves, but many of the consumer high-end filters like Fram Ultra or Wix XP have silicone anti-drain back valves, um, which is usually differentiated by uh, black being nitrile, red being silicone. Is there a reason for this? Uh, Chris, I I have asked internally about this a little bit before, and you know, I think I think the majority of our product on the lube side of things do use uh, do use nitrile instead of silicone. Um, it doesn't appear that there's really a significant amount of uh, reason that, that, that we've ever seen as a business to to feel like we need to use silicone. I mean, and we're we're playing in the heavy duty and you know high horsepower game, um, but on the drain back side of things, right? Uh, I, I don't know. You know, that could be just a uh, market strategy trying to you know trying to sell to folks think thinking we, hey, we got a little bit more premium product for this i suspect some of that is cost though as well nitrile versus silicone i'm sure there's some cost difference there in terms of manufacturing so um i can dig into that a little bit more and try to get some answers for you chris but as far as i know i think our business has generally used nitrile and it's never ne that's never really been a point of contention or, or issue for anybody with uh, with us here at Fleet Guard on on the heavy duty side of things. But I'll ask and try to get some more info for you. All right. Uh, any and yes, Justin Fleet Guard fit. Yeah, if you got it, uh, just go look for it or shoot me a note if you can't find it, and we'll we'll talk more. Well, guys, I know we ran a couple minutes long. Really want to thank you for your time and attention today. Appreciate it. Hope you guys come back for our next session. We're going to be back next month uh, covering a new topic. And you can go again out to the Fleet Guard website, find the product training link, and see our calendar of what we have scheduled for the remainder of the year. Would be interested in uh, having you guys come back and really appreciate it. If you can, check out that survey. That helps us, uh, helps us prepare for the next one. And thank you so much. Hope you have an awesome rest of your Thursday. Great rest of your week. And we will talk again soon. Thanks.